Good morning, everybody. I uh, am sad that I am not with you this morning, but uh, you are in my thoughts and my prayers as the youth and I are currently in Columbia right now at the Revolution Youth Trip. And so it is a uh, joy to be with them, and I look forward to seeing all of you next week. Well, let us pray. Lord, we give you thanks for this wonderful day in which you have blessed us with, for the chance to be able to come together and to worship you in spirit and truth. And Lord, we pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. A couple months back, I was uh, listening to a movie, and a poem came across the screen, and it really grabbed my attention. And, and I'm not usually much for poetry, but this, this poem uh, spoke to where I was at a place. I was taking a class on death and dying and on grief, and it was a poem by John Donne, and I would like to share that with you this morning. It is called The Holy Sonnet 10 by John Donne. Death be not proud, though some have called thee mighty and dreadful, for thou art not so. For those whom thou thinkest, thou dost overthrow. Die not, poor death, nor yet canst thou kill me from rest and sleep, which but thy pictures be. Much pleasure then from thee, much more must flow, and soonest our best men with thee do go. Rest of their bones and souls delivery. Thou art slave to fate, chance kings and desperate men, and dost with poison, war, and sickness dwell, and poppy or charms can make us sleep as well. And better than thy stroke, why swellest thou then? One short sleep past, we wake eternally, and death shall be no more. Death, thou shalt die. And as I heard this poem, the line, Mighty and dreadful, for thou art not so, struck a chord with me. And it made me stop and, and to think about these words and about how often we think that death is almighty and that it's dreadful and something to be feared and scared and worried about. But in this poem, we are reminded that death is not mighty and it is not dreadful, but rather death is something that will die. And as we hear this passage this morning, we encounter Peter, uh, the disciple who just recognized that Jesus was the Messiah. And, and Peter recognized his Messiahship because he saw Jesus healing the sick. He saw Jesus performing miracles. And he saw Jesus inviting everyone to come and to be a part of the family of God. And he was in awe of all that Jesus had done. And this was the kind of Messiah that he had been waiting for, that all of Israel had been longing for, a Savior to come and to restore the Davidic kingdom, to set everything right, to overthrow the Romans, and to allow peace to reign on earth. And so Peter's excited as he sees Jesus the healer, as he sees Jesus the miracle maker, as he sees Jesus the Son of God who is compassionate and loving. And so when Jesus approaches Peter and he tells him that the Son of Man must die, that he must be rejected by the elders and the chief priests, Peter is hurt and Peter is fearful of death. Because in the Roman world, death signified defeat. And the symbol of defeat was the cross. And when Jesus tells Peter that he must go to the cross, Peter is afraid that God has been defeated, that evil has won, and that the man in which he has placed his trust, his hope, his future, is someone who is about to be defeated by the powers and the principalities. And so Peter rebukes Jesus and tells Jesus that you cannot die, 
For you are the one who brings the good news. For you are the one who brings hope. You are the one who has offered us a glimpse of joy. That we believe in you. And that we trust that you are God himself. And so Jesus takes Peter aside. And he rebukes him before all of the other disciples. And he says that he, had, he came so that he could fulfill his mission. A mission that would take him to the cross. A mission where he would stand on the outskirts of the city. Humilified. A criminal. An outcast. Someone who was seen as a threat to humanity and a threat to the Roman Empire. And so Pontius Pilate ordered him to be crucified. And Jesus went to the cross. And the disciples believed that Jesus had been defeated. Because we believe that death is the end. That death defeats all that is good. That the kingdom of heaven that we see in Jesus Christ is killed on that cross. And so it's natural for us to think that death is mighty and dreadful. But this passage this morning reminds us that death is not mighty. That death is not dreadful. And it reminds us that the hopes that we had in Jesus Christ, that the disciples had in Jesus Christ, were not killed that day in Golgotha. That they were not crucified and that they were not buried. But rather our hope would come from the empty tomb three days later, when Jesus would raise from the dead. And so Jesus takes Peter aside, and in a sense he's taking you and me aside, to invite us not to look upon death frightened or scared. What he's inviting us to do is to have faith. To have faith That God has conquered death. To have faith that death shall be no more. That death has died. And that death will ultimately die one day. When we are all resurrected. And the kingdom of heaven comes into our midst. And so he tells Peter. And he tells you and he tells me. That as his people. That we are to live a life of faith. A life of trusting solely in God. A life of believing that our hope will never be lost. Because our hope is in Jesus Christ. Our hope is in the one who conquered death. As I was reflecting on this passage and thinking back on so many people who have made an impact in my life. And and many of these people lived hundreds of years ago. And I like to call them my spiritual mentors. They're people who I've read, who I've studied, who I've thought about, who I have seen Christ in them, and who I have grown closer to Christ. And I uh, found a a new uh, mentor that uh, has helped me to understand the faith. And I'd love to share his story with you this day. He's a guy who lived about 30 years ago, and he lived in El Salvador, and he was an archbishop of the Catholic Church, and and he had no plans to be the archbishop, but rather they came and they told him, you, Oscar Romero, are the next archbishop of El Salvador, and he was given this title, this, this role, this mission in the midst of a hard time in the history of El Salvador. Because there was a lot of civil unrest. There was a lot of fighting. And there was 
untold amount of murders that were taking place. And as Romero takes the office of Archbishop, one of his best friends, a priest, who had been an advocate for those who were poor, for those who had no voice, for those who were being rounded up at night and murdered by the government, that his friend, the priest who cared for these, was gunned down and murdered in the middle of a mass, the Catholic celebration. And so Romero is faced with a decision, a decision that would define him as a priest, that would define him as a follower of Jesus Christ, and who would define him as a person. That as he gathered around with the other church leaders, he heard two competing stories. On the one hand, there was the story where they said, do not worry. That this is all a part of a grander plan. Let the government take care of what needs to be done so that we can enjoy the riches and so that we can enjoy peace once the government quells all the violence. And then on the other hand, were priests. Priests who were not serving the large churches, but rather priests who were in the parishes with those who were being murdered, with those whose lives had been taken. And they said, no, that we as the body of Christ are to uphold Jesus' message, the good news, that He came so that we may have peace, so that we may have abundant life, and so that we might be able to live with one another. And they said that when there is injustice, that we must stand up for those who are being persecuted, for those who are being harmed, for those who have lost their lives so that others could gain more. And so Romero sat in his office and he sat there with a decision. As I said, it would be a decision that would define him as a person, as a Christian, and as the Archbishop of El Salvador. And Romero decided to stand up to those who were killing, that he commanded them in the name of Jesus Christ to not follow the orders of their bosses, to not kill innocent men, women, and children. And Romero began to preach and proclaim that God came for all of us so that we could live in harmony with one another. And when Romero made this decision to confront the powers and the principalities that were wreaking havoc on his nation, he knew that he was confronting death. But as John Donne says, death shall be no more Death, thou shalt die. Romero knew that death was no more because he knew that death had died that day on the cross outside of the city. And he knew that when he followed Jesus, that he would pick up his cross and in a sense that he would take on the death that Christ had had outside the city. And by picking up that cross, that he would put his faith in God and that he would place his faith that God was in control and that death had died and that once short sleep passed, that he would wake eternally. And so Romero continued to preach He continued to proclaim 
that all persons are beloved by God, cherished, and that they should be cared for, not kidnapped, exploited, or murdered. And as he was preaching this message, the powers and principalities came to him. And they said, you better stop preaching this message because you will die. But Romero kept preaching because he knew that death had no power over him. And one day, while he was in Mass, as he was lifting up the cup, the chalice holding the blood of Christ, gunmen, hired by those powers, gunned him down and murdered him as he stood at our Lord's table. As I think about Romero, I think about the other mentors in my life who have meant so much to me personally. I think of Ignatius of Antioch. He lived around the end of the first century and he was a devout follower of Christ. And he placed all his faith and trust in God and he went about the city proclaiming the good news that death was no more, that there is hope in Jesus Christ, that when we are in Christ, that we will wake eternally. And so Ignatius of Antioch picked up his cross and proclaimed the good news that Jesus is the one who frees us so that we may have life and have it abundantly. And the powers And the principalities came and they arrested Ignatius and they sentenced him to death, death in the Colosseum of ancient Rome at the mouth of lions. And as Ignatius took that long journey from Antioch to Rome, he professed his love for God and said that the lions, that the government, that nothing had power over him because death had died. Death was no more. And I think of John Wesley, of the leader of our denomination, Methodist, that Wesley was faced with a choice one day. Would he stay and preach in the comforts of the parish churches Or would he go outside and meet the people where they were, in the mines and on the hillsides? And Wesley chose to leave the comforts of the parish, to become ostracized by the church, so that he could do the church's work, so that he could tell people that there is a God who is present, that there is a God who loves you, And that there is a God who sees you as a beloved and cherished child of His. And that God loves us. And that God desires for us to grow closer to Him while serving Him and being in ministry with Him. And so Wesley left the comforts behind. And he picked up his cross and he went from town to town preaching the good news. And I think about Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a German pastor living during the Nazi regime. And as he looked around and as he saw his fellow countrymen, as he saw his fellow human beings being herded up and put into concentration camps, that Bonhoeffer believed and took seriously Christ's command to love God with all our heart and to love our neighbors as ourselves. And just like the other men, Bonhoeffer believed 
and his actions proved his beliefs. And he died in a concentration camp. But before he died in that camp, he had become a pastor to those who were there, reminding them that God has conquered death, that death shall be no more, death thou shalt die. And I think of Henri Nouwen, a priest who was a a great thinker and a great mind for the church, who had a passion for reaching people and for inviting us to go deeper into our faith. And he was a professor at Yale and at Harvard, but both times when he held chairs there, his faith called him into action. And so he left the comforts of the Ivy League and first went to South America and cared for the orphaned and for the widowed. That he took seriously Christ's command that we should love and care for those who are hurting, who are sick, and who have no one else to care for them. And after he returned from Latin America to Harvard, The comfort of the Ivy League was nothing in comparison to the call he felt to go and to be with those marginalized in our own society, those who are on the outskirts, who are invisible to many, to those who suffer with mental disabilities. And now when went, to a large community, and he was their pastor. And he let them know that they were loved, cherished by God. And he died in that community, serving those individuals. When Jesus tells Peter that if You are to be my follower. You must first pick up your cross. What Jesus is asking Peter is, Do you have faith in me? Do you trust me? Do you believe that the kingdom of heaven has come near? And so this Lenten season, Christ asks us that same question. Do we have faith in Him to have complete control of our lives? Do we have faith in Him to let go of control and to let Him lead us where we are needed? Do we have faith in Christ that we also will pick up our cross and go and serve? And I saw it read or written somewhere that belief is when someone thinks it or believes it in their mind. But faith is when someone takes those beliefs and allows them to shape their life. Faith is our belief in action. And so this Lenten season, as we prepare to go to the cross, we're invited to stop and reflect on our own lives. That do we have the faith to pick up our cross? Do we have the faith in believing that death shall be no more? Death thou shalt die? For when we pick up that cross, what we are doing 
is we're serving God by serving one another. That we're serving God by proclaiming the good news. And that we are serving God by saying, You are my God, and I trust in you. And so as we let go of control, what I invite you to do this day, this week, and this month as we prepare for Easter is to stop trying to control every part of your life. Because when we try to control things, we worry. We worry about the future. We worry about this or that. And when we try to control that we are driven out of fear, that our fear leads us and defines us as a people. But when we have faith, and when we have trust in God, that it's out of love that we serve. And I know each and every Lenten season, we always give up something. We give up chocolate, we give up candies, we give up sodas or coffee. We give up something that we cherish and we enjoy. Something that makes us stop and reflect and think about God each and every time we have a craving for that thing we've given up. But what we truly need to give up this Lent is control. Trying to control God, trying to control our lives, worrying about everything, fearful of death. Because we know that when Christ died, that death could not hold him down. And that on the third day, he arose from the dead and he ascended into heaven. And so this Lenten season, may we place our trust in God. And friends, Bonhoeffer, Wesley, Romero and Ignatius placed their trust in God. And it began one day, and they began a journey, a journey of completely trusting in God. And as they were drawn closer to the heart of God, they never ever wanted to return to controlling their own lives. Because when we serve, when we give, we receive. And when we give our lives to God and to others, we are saved and we experience the abundant life. So church, let us see the ways in which we can pick up our cross. Ways in which we can deny ourselves so that others may encounter God in us and that we might be able to point to the God who saves, the God who's with us this day. So let us let go of control and let us begin that journey of leaving behind our worries and concerns and trusting in God. For we know one short sleep past, we wake eternally, and death shall be no more. Death, thou shalt die. May we give our lives unto God this day so that we may die with Him and be raised in His glory. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. In response to the spoken word, I invite the ushers to come forward as we present our offerings and our tithes and our gifts and our graces to God. May the ushers come forward.